I'm doubling you up on DraftKings. Right, look, I did. I'm beating your ass in fantasy baseball. But We're not playing this week. Well, I'm beating your ass in standings. You suck. We play each other next week. Yeah. Yes, the outcome will be shared. Seems like I just beat you pretty recently. It's really good. We're bringing up old shit. <laughs> See, this dude's worried about standings like we're halfway to the playoffs. I'm ahead of you in the standings. I'm talking about DraftKings today. Just a one-day contest. Welcome, everybody, to the Stone on Sports Podcast. My name is Matt. Really happy to be here with you today. Um, I want to thank our sponsor, Rocky's Pizza of uh, Sports Creek, Michigan, for helping to make this show happen. As always, I'm joined by Power and Glory here, Kyle and Ramey. Ramey, how's it hanging, brother? It's going well, Matt. Hope you're doing well as well. Wonder, Kyle, who's Power and who's Glory? That's a, that, that is exactly my question. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm afraid to answer. <laughs> Let's just leave it a mystery. Get me glory. <laughs> uh, things are well, you know, starting to get towards that time of the year where we're getting ready for NFL and college football. And it's just kind of waiting for the next few weeks to pass by so we can start really getting into football. I'm excited about it. Kyle, how are you doing? Great. Doing great. Same football. Can't wait. Can't. Wait, are it's like just like you good? Yeah. You good? You good, man? You doing good? I'm great. You know, I am happy that fake it, fake it till you make it. Yeah, yeah, fake it till you make it. Take a pill, fake it till you make it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Bye. Um, yeah. Now football. We're just training camps are starting this week. I think some reported late last week. Um. Excited, ready. Wanted to start hearing about you know who's going to make the team, the bubble, you know stories from training camp. Um, you know there will be those uh, big injuries that happen in camp. You know that the rail, uh, you know, good players season, which sucks for them and the team, of course. But this is the game they've chosen. It is. It is indeed, and. Uh, Kind of going off that theme, I think we're going to hit up the NFC South this week, do our divisional previews, and then we're going to get into our regular pick sixer, our favorite baseball players, so that we can talk a little baseball as we get into the dog days. We'll round things out with our back-in-the-day replay. So, you guys want to get started? Yes. Let's talk some efforts. We'll just go with the Bucs. They finished first in the division. <laughs> finished first in the division last year with a uh, losing record, 8-9. No team was over uh, 500 in the division. The other three teams, ironically, were all 7-10. Uh, you know, Tampa Bay won their Super Bowl a couple of years ago, and now they're going to be hot garbage. Top Brady left. And that is the... They're going to have the type of season... That is the cost of winning a recent Super Bowl. You know, you spent, you brought all in. Brady retired. You unloaded everyone. You know, Mason, Fournette, Hicks, Julio, Giovanni, Logan, Ryan, uh, Murphy, Bunting. Like, everybody's gone. Uh, they're not going to be very good. There's some pieces. But uh, I expect them to be... In the bottom division. Now, I have been shame last. Yeah, I just don't think they're going to be very good either. And, I mean, you hit it right on the head, Kyle. It's the the cost of winning a Super Bowl and continuing to try to bring in veteran pieces to supplement Tom Brady as your quarterback. Tom Brady retires, and you just don't have a lot in the way of young players or draft capital at this point to replenish and, and rebuild quickly. So... Not only did they let a lot of veterans go um, after knowing that Tom Brady was going to retire, they've got some pieces that they may still look to trade prior to the deadline to try to maybe get some draft picks for the future. I know they, they've still got Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. Those are two guys that 
I just can't see being around for the long term if they end up going the route of a rookie quarterback. But at the same time, you do need some talent around the rookie quarterback so that they can succeed. So that's the thing I'll be looking at this year is do they just completely blow it up and, and trade anything that, that has a pulse to to try to get as many draft picks for the future to to rebuild that thing? Yeah, it, this season really for them is going to be about evaluating the talent they have on the roster to see who's going to be the core of the team going forward. Um, in the draft, they went defense heavy. Five of their eight picks were on the, uh, that side of the ball. Um, you know, the skill position players, wide receiver, you know, they're pretty damn good there. It's probably a, a top 10 duo with, with Godwin and Evans. So whoever ends up starting at quarterback is is going to have some pieces around them. Um, it'll be interesting to see if the offensive line improves any. They were a bottom third uh, run blocking line last year, according to to PFF. So, you know, with Rashad White leading the backfield there last season, he only had three point eight yards a carry. Is that offensive line going to be able to to help him bring that per carry total up? to take pressure off of Baker Mayfield or Kyle Trask or, or whoever's taking snaps there. But I mean, regardless, they're playing a first place schedule because they won the division last year. And that's a bad combination for them, especially with, with the, you know, overall lack of talent on this team. This is a very low ceiling team and I wouldn't be shocked if, you know, they're right up there in contention for the number one pick in next year's draft. Yeah, I would I would say they'd be a bottom five team. Uh, yeah. Draft Kings has them at six and a half. You know, I, I think most of us would probably take the under on that. I know we usually talk about that a little bit later in the segment, but and that first place schedule that you mentioned, Matt, that's that's tough. You know, they got to play Philly, got to play at Buffalo, uh, at San Francisco. Yeah, they've got a it's four gonna, win ceiling. Yeah, it, yeah, it's 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 going to be tough, and I think their defense. Will still be kind of strong um, with Vita Vey. They had a nice draft, as you mentioned, with defense. Uh, and then with defense first, defensive tackle, Elijah Cansey, really excited. I saw him in a couple games at Pitt, or not, you know, person, but on TV. And, you know, he's compared to Aaron Bout. He's more of a pass rush tackle, you know, inside lineman than he is um, a run stopper. He can do it. But uh, really excited to see. What he can do with Vita Vey, uh, they still have a pretty decent linebacker core with uh, Levante David and Devin White. I think is still there, I believe. Yeah, and they've got yeah, he's still there. Shaq, Shaq Barra, Antoine Winfield Jr. Yep, yep, yep. he's gonna um, play free safety this year. Position he played before last year, he played the strong side. Uh, so we'll see what uh, difference that makes. But for them to do anything, they they have to. Uh, get some turnovers on that defense for them to do anything. Last year they were minus two in differential, and you know they finished eight nine. So with the quarterback room, it's uh, it's not looking good. I'm not a huge Baker Mayfield fan. I'm not a hater either. He was electric to watch in, in college there for that couple of years. That was you know, a few years. Uh, but I, I, I like Matt said, this is an evaluation. Yeah, and I mean. It'll be interesting to see who goes in as the starter. If, if I think it's Baker right now, but Kyle Trask is there too, and he's been there for a couple of years. So knowing that they're not going to be very good, it'll be interesting to see if they give Trask much run to potentially be the backup quarterback of the future. I just can't see him playing well enough with that offense and that offensive line to, to show that he's going to be the guy moving forward. So I think it's very much a transition right. year. I, I guess my thought is, is if they had, uh, if they thought they had something in Trask, they probably would have brought Baker in. You know, and um, I think they've kind of already shown what, what he's 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 going to be a backup. Baker's going to struggle. Baker will hurt his shoulder. Baker will play through it. And now, he is a tough guy. He's all there in play. I give him that. He showed some promise last year with uh, with the Rams as well in a short time. Sorry, sorry, Matt. I pulled a Kyle. Oh, you're good. Um, 
I think one thing we haven't hit on, though, that's going to be a big question is, is Todd Bowles the right person to lead this team through the rebuild? It's not like he set the world on fire when he was with the Jets. You know, there's a reason he was let go. Um, and now you're you're starting from, you know, if not the bottom, damn near, and you don't have your quarterback of the future in place. Like, is he the right guy who's going to build the – support staff around whoever comes in to take the reins because if they're picking in you know the top two there's some some damn good uh prospects coming out of college that teams are going to be very keen on getting yeah yeah he's i mean he's a defensive guy and like i said the defense would probably be the the actual strength of the team byron left which is out uh dave canales is uh in his oc don't know much about him just know he's with with Seattle and Pete Carroll for the last decade. So, uh, not a name I know. So if you have somebody that's trying to get one of the top three quarterbacks in the draft next year, no knock on this guy. I don't, I just don't. Calling it now. JJ McCarthy is going to be a top five pick next year. If he has a, if he has a, if he has a dude, it could very well be. It's a very type of it. Well, type B. There's that some. There's some. We've been talking Drake May and Caleb Williams, but they have some, you know, uh, negatives. I think if if the year goes like we're thinking it's going to, I think Bulls will be out. I think they'll clean house, especially if they have an opportunity to draft one of those quarterbacks. They're going to want to get an offensive guy in there as head coach. Um, I just. I just don't think this is going to be a very good team this year. I would go with the under as well. If the under is at six and a half, I don't think I don't think they're going to sniff that. Yeah, yeah, and I think yeah, we mentioned Chase, Chase Edmonds. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to be able to run the ball, but I don't. Like I said, if the defense could create some turnovers and stuff, and some things happen, yeah, I could see him. Winning a few more games, but not over that six and a half. Like I said, I think they'd normally win three or four. Maybe they win two more. Maybe they get six. But that was tough, that schedule, that first place schedule when they were in 8 19. Ugly. Ugly, ugly. Uh, next, we'll go with uh, overall second finish in the division last year Carolina Panthers, 7 and 10. Uh, I'm high on this team. If you had to put a gun in my head right now and, and, and pick a division winner, winner, I'm going with Carolina. Um, I think the pieces they got there, uh, new new regime. Yeah, they lost DJ Moore, but it was worth the price to get Bryce Young. Uh, I think he's going to be a very good quarterback, regardless of what people say about his size. He, he played in the SEC. <laughs> everybody big, everybody fast there. And he stayed healthy. Uh, schedule week seven by. Uh, so they got three road games in a row against Titans, Bucks, Saints. Not really tough. I think they could be three and zero in those road games, feasibly. I know a division game against the Saints, the NFC South, they they beat each other. Pretty good, but uh, they're they're. You know, teams that finished in the same place in their respective division, they got to go at Seahawks, at Miami, at home against Dallas. That's a little tougher. Yeah, I, th- I think, I, I mean, obviously they've they've hired Frank Reich. They got a new coach in there with an offensive mind. He did a nice job at Indy. Um, I think he kind of got a raw deal, although he made his bed when he pushed to trade for Carson Wentz. Now he had the lie in it. So, um, but he, I, that being said, I think he's a decent head coach. It seems to have surrounded himself with some good offensive guys like Jim Caldwell um, and others. Uh, so the staff is there and, and they were smart. They've got the number one pick. They got a rookie quarterback on a rookie contract. So they went out and signed Miles Sanders, Adam Thalen, um, DJ Char, Kate Hurst. Uh, they brought in Andy Dalton to be the backup and mentor Bryce Young. So, uh, it seems to, excellent. I think yeah. that's excellent. Excellent choice. Yeah. Uh, they're doing everything they can to set him up for success. He's a mature guy too. So uh, n- don't really need to worry about that, but you're going to 
you're putting pieces in place to make him successful and and not have to be that leader right out of the gate. You want your quarterback to be the leader, but you've also got to let you put a lot of veterans in place that's going to allow him just to focus on getting up to speed in the NFL, being a, a good quarterback. Yeah, and one thing that they did right there, I think Frank Reich is a middling NFL coach. I don't think there's anything remarkable about him, but he put together a rock star staff down there in Carolina. He did. Um, you know, he kind of lucked out. Deuce Daly needed to move down to the area to be closer to some family. You know, he brought in guys like Jim Caldwell, Dom Capers, Ajiro Avero, um, Thomas Brown running the offense. He's not going to call plays because that's something Frank Reich will do, but he'll still bring some McVay um, influence into the offense. Chris Tabor was a, a holdover special teams coordinator. He took their special teams from 28th to 4th in the NFL. Like, there's there's some real talent there. The players just need to make sure that they're going to be coachable. I think this is a team that you're going to see a lot of their improvement in season and as the season goes on. So... You know, I look for them to be a a team that kind of finishes out the year strong. Yeah, I, their their defense will be pretty good. They got Todd Wash from the Lions as well, D line coach. He's really good. Did well with uh, Aiden Hutchinson last year. Well, except against the Panthers. Except against the Panthers, where they <laughs> Frank Reich saw him and said, "You know what? Three hundred and twenty yards. That's the guy I want coaching my defensive." Yeah, three hundred and twenty yards. Yep, um, that was rough. Um, and D'Angelo Hall too is the assistant defensive backs coach, ex player. So I like he's got a. It kind of reminds me of the Lions staff where they built it with a lot of ex players, and um, I think I think it's hard to lose locker rooms when the coaches, the majority of the coaches, are ex players. Yeah, it is. I mean, in, in regardless, my opinion of Frank Reich, he still a respected player and coach and head coach in this league. You know, yeah. um, you know, he goes about things his own way and, and, you know, let's be real. If you've made it to that point in your career, it works. You know? Yeah. Um, uh, but defense talking about that again, they are, uh, transitioning to the three, four under a Vero. Uh, they got a strong linebacking core for that. Frank Hugo, Shaq Thompson, uh, Brian Burns there as well. He's a stud. He is. They had 89 tackles. He tied eight for 12 and a half sacks with Max Crosby. Um, and their defensive back there, J.C. Horn, had some struggles with injuries. If he could stay healthy, he's somebody that could be, he could be a shutdown corner. He could be a Defensive player of the year candidate, top five candidate this year or next, if he can stay healthy. Yeah, and Von Bell is going to help solidify that secondary too. Von Bell is as well. Very good safety that uh, signed the offseason from the Bengals. Like him, like him, like him. Other Other signing they had, um, Rohel Sanders, he's coming in to lead the backfield. Um, He had a great season last season. Behind that Eagles offensive line, it was really good if you look at it on the surface or his county, counting stats, uh, but he was very inefficient. He had a career-worst 4.8 yards per touch last year. So it was all about uh, quantity as opposed to quality. Yeah, and he had that huge, great line. It took four seasons for him to do something like that. Right. Um, I don't see it be repl- being replicated down there just be man when McCaffrey left they switched more to like power run it and that's where they had their most success they were able to play some defense and run that power run they were in some games up before in the fourth quarter um Foreman and Hubbard were a hell of a combo they were they were they were Foreman left uh when he followed DJ Moore the the Bears too right I think the I think they have two or three players from Charlotte on the team of the Bears now, but yeah, it's it, it'll be interesting. What I see is the wide receivers. How does that wide receiver break down? If you look at some of the, they're all stacked together. Um, dra- ADP draft position, 
Freeland's a low end at, uh, well, oh, yeah, look at it, 62. And Terrace Marshall is the 84th receiver taken off the board. You got Chark and Mingo smashed in the middle. Who's going to end up being the number one? I don't. I don't really see anyone out of that group emerging to the degree that they would be the number one. Quote unquote. Now somebody is going to lead the league or the, lead the team in targets. Sure. I would say probably Thielen would be my best guess, but I mean he's getting up there in years, and I'm kind of surprised they gave him a three year deal. Yeah, he he took a step back last year. What's really exciting is Mingo, Jonathan Mingo, the receiver they drafted. Potential is very dynamic, has the potential to to come out and and be a number one. Yeah. I feel we'll just do Chark and Thielen on the outside and use Mingo uh, up the middle. And a lot of that's gonna depend on who starts to build that chemistry with Young the fastest. Interesting to hear those reports coming out soon. Yep. Sorry, Ramy, we'll shut up for a second. No, you're good. <laughs> I'm just, just enjoying the the conversation, I, I agree. I think I think this team will be better. I'm not quite as high as you uh or Kyle on them. Um I think that they'll they'll finish I think they'll finish second or third in the division. Um I think that they're gonna be like you said, Matt, I think they're gonna be a team that improves during the season. That defense is gonna be relied upon early. Um and it's just a matter of how quickly can can Young develop into uh, a true number one that's able to go out there with the weapons that he has and be able to make things happen. I see him struggling at first just because that's a lot of new pieces coming in for a rookie quarterback while they're veterans. It's it's going to take some time, so he's going to have some some growing pains. But I think he's got. A little, I think you mentioned it, Kyle. He was he was in the SEC. Um, I don't think his size will be an issue. Uh, the NFL's not. While they still kind of put some emphasis on that on that height requirement there's there's been too many examples of shorter quarterbacks succeeding for this to be an issue for Bryce Young so I'm excited to see where this team goes uh uh Matt you talked about Frank Reich uh when I he was a a decent coach but yeah I, he's not lighting the world on fire with anything he's done and to his credit he he brought in a bunch of guys that are going to be able to shoulder a lot of that load so that he can just be more of a of a CEO type of, of a coach. So uh, I think this, they were smart to, tr to do what they did to trade for the number one pick, get their quarterback. And now the next two, three years is really going to be focusing on just supplementing around him and watching him develop. And, and I think that they're a team in two or three years, that could be really kind of pushing some of the other teams in the NFC. Yeah. And Frank Reich is somebody who you can trust to develop your number one overall pick quarterback. Um, you know he's not going to fuck it up. You know, it. Carson Wentz looked like ass here recently, but he also played at a damn near MVP level at times prior to getting hurt. So he did. He did. And the Frank, Frank Reich runs an offense that is very demanding on the quarterback. Uh, a lot of pre-snap, a lot of post-snap. Bryce Young's capable of doing that. He's, he's already shown that in college, that he's capable of making decisions quick. And more than uh, more than not, right decisions. Um, I'd say he's almost kind of a point guard in a way. Um, he's not. I don't mean that he's not going to take like deep shots down the field. Like Are you that. comparing him to Charlie Ward? <laughs> yeah, Charlie. <laughs> um, but that's my feelings. I, I'm I'm high on this team. So I think they'll win the division. They're a team coming up, like Matt said, second half team like that, where we finally get some things figured out and be operating in uh, max, you know, at maximum efficiency, or they could actually do some damage and win a first round game, depending on the opponent. Yeah, their their win totals at seven and a half. I'm confidently over that. Oh. I think they're an eight or nine win team, but they think they also have that in common with a couple other teams in the division. This is a this is a free for all vision. It's up for the taking from from any of these teams, except Tampa. There ain't no way. Yeah. Well, yeah. Vegas. Except except. But I I wouldn't be shocked if any one of the other three teams ended up winning the division. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. 
and just looking at their schedule, it's I, I I'm with you. I think they win eight or nine games. Their schedule isn't tough. They're going to have the second place um, schedule just because they finished second by default last year due to tiebreakers. It just there, there's a couple of games at Seattle, at Detroit, at Miami where they're they're going to struggle. But they, I mean, their division is not lighting the world on fire. They play the AFC South, so there's wins there for the taking. Um, and I do think that they get to. I think they get to at least eight wins. They play the Lions twice. They play them once in the preseason and once in the regular season. It's really strange. You don't typically yeah. do that. Now. Yeah, it is. You know, obviously the right thing to do is completely open up the playbook in the first meeting there in the preseason because that's when it's going to count. You want to sure, they're crisp for the next round. <laughs> uh, yeah, Miles, uh, Miles Sanders. I don't, I don't love it, but. Back to him, I, I I just don't don't see it from a fantasy perspective. Last year, fifty percent of his points came in four games. So behind a great line, behind with a quarterback with thousand yard rushing ability, right? They ain't scoring. Well, I don't think he'll score double digit touchdowns this year like he did last year. No way. Um, yeah, I also have them over. As well, I think they went nine games. That 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 would win the division in this division, I believe. We shall see. Who knows? It might take thirteen to win it. Yeah, I say probably not, but <laughs> not just bloody. just saying it's possible. Last year's third place finisher, the New Orleans Saints, uh, also like I said before, went seven and ten. Uh, Tough schedule for them. They got Derek Carr this year. Uh, That's an upgrade over last year, uh, obviously, with uh, Jameis Webster. And, uh, Jesus, who was there? Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill. Uh, Andy Dalton was there last year. Yeah. Thank you, Andy Dalton. Jeez. Andy Dalton. So, yeah. And that didn't go too well. Uh, some talent there. Uh, Michael Thomas, hopefully, play it fucking season of football he hasn't played since uh, 21 and it wasn't very much uh, Chris Olave I like Chris Olave I, I would if offensive player to hear for this division which is a big call because then you kind of have to say that Carr needs to be you know pretty decent yeah and I don't see that happening I'm not a uh car fan at all one season in his career over 4200 yards one season in his career with 30 or more touchdowns last season he had a worse yards per attempt than Ryan Tannehill and Marcus Mariota and when you're throwing the ball that short that constantly and still not getting great results because he kind of fucking sucked and he had Devontae Adams there and still played like a scrub-ass QB, who was so bad they benched his shit for the last two games and then just cut his ass loose. And now he's rolling into town like he's the next Drew Brees. No, dude. No, no, no. I think no, no, no. Olave is best when when he's going deep and Derek Carr isn't the dude to accomplish that. If you, if, I think Jameis Winston would be a better quarterback for Chris Olave. Chris Derek. Olave is still going to be good. But I think he's going to be like 1,100 yards good where if they had made a different decision at quarterback, he could be like he has the talent to be 1,700 yards good. I mean, Carr was fifth in deep ball attempts last year. You had Devontae Adams. All you do is throw Based deep up to him and hope for, well, hope for the best. I don't throw deep. I mean, you can, but God, he's so good after the catch. You know, throw something short, let him make somebody miss, and then he's, he's gone. But, uh, how dare yeah, you break an Ohio State product? I like Carr. I think he'll hit 3,500 yards this year. I think it's going to happen. There's I. <laughs> I I feel like the Saints have been a team that have needed to blow things up for about four or five years now. And they've just kind of been putting it together with, you know, a solid they, defense. Yeah, they do have a solid defense. They were, they were ninth in points on defense. They've got some good players on defense. They have some good skill players, but 
I just, they've been in cap hell for the last three or four years. They don't have a quarterback. I don't think Carr is the answer. Um, I think they'll be okay, but I think it'll be another year of kind of right around 500. I know, Matt, you talked about it. Other than the Bucks, I think all three of these other teams are going to be right in the mix for things. I just feel like that they're, they're, they need to do something to to make a definitive move in the future. And maybe they think signing Carr was that move. I just feel like it's kind of kicking the can down the road for a few more years where they're going to end up having to blow it up eventually anyway. And they're just going to kind of be around a 500 team for as long as they continue to do this. Um, yeah. I I know you talked about, I, we, we need to touch on Alvin Kamara. Um, oh, for sure. Is, is he going to play this year? Like uh, He's going to play, so. But a couple of days probably. He, uh, if I remember right, he went down or some shit and it ended up being a misdemeanor. So it wasn't yeah. like a felony, which is, I think, what he was looking at. I imagine he'll get suspended for like three games. I don't think yeah. it's going to be no year long suspension. For first four games are Tennessee, Carolina, Green Bay, Tampa Bay. So, uh, I mean, with, if he had four games and they went two and two, that'd be a win. That'd be good. You know, they brought in Jamal uh, Williams, too, to help out who had a career year in, in Detroit last year. I don't know if he, I mean, yeah, he was a goal line machine last year, wasn't he? But I don't, you got, with Taysom, Taysom Hill stealing touchdowns, uh, he's back in the kit. What did he have last year? 20? Hmm. Jamal? Jamal. Uh, 17. 17, something like that. He's not going to get that again. Oh, hell no. But they had some uh, a couple dudes, Jawan Johnson and Rashid Shaheed, flashed Shahid towards Shahid. towards the end of the season. Man, I like, like that. Like, um, you know, so those could be a, a couple of diamonds in the rough that if they can continue to develop, will you know help to support the offense. They've been they've consistently been a good team, Ramey, and and you know to your point of them just kind of you know, spit and glue and duct tape because of the cap. Like, they built it on a foundation of defense, like, really starting with the end of Drew Brees' career. Um, you know, at this point, they're they're slightly above average. Uh, pass rush is, is not so great, uh, but they're decent in coverage. You know, Marcus Lattimore has been somebody who's been in their secondary for, you know, what, seven, eight years now at this point. And he's somebody who's who's great against the bigger bodied receivers, but struggles against the smaller, quick receivers. Yeah. Uh yeah, their defense has kept a bit. Uh, they're fifth overall in yards per game allowed. Uh second pass yards per game allowed, but twenty fourth at rush uh yards per allowed. So hopefully they uh can figure out that have Get that great linebacker Demario Davis, Pete Werner kind of hit the scene a little bit last year. Uh, got injured for a few games, and that wasn't quite the same guy in the second half. The defense is going to keep him in there. Dennis Allen's a defensive coach. They'll get this team some turnovers as well. See if the offense can do anything. If you're Oh, if we're talking fantasy, Kamara, somebody I just completely out on. Doesn't I would be completely out on him even if he didn't have the legal trouble this year. You think he's just washed up, or I don't know. I just think his touchdown upside will be capped with Jamal, with Taysom Hill, with a healthy Mike Thomas. Yeah, if he stays healthy, just seems and, like and he can, can you count on the field? Yeah, and can you count on Derek Carr to really distribute the ball that effectively throughout the season? Yeah. You know, so, so that could be a, a cap on touchdown productivity. They're still 13 to 14 million under the cap, depending on uh, which service you're using or website you're using. But Hunter Renfro from, from, or from, from the Raiders has somebody linked there for months. <laughs> <laughs> and I know he was there. He was there when they were in Oakland. So I think yeah, that's a right. Okay. Uh, he was with Carr last year, and they what? 
the Raiders got Jacoby Myers, who's in the slot, so they could kind of afford to get rid of uh, Renfro. I think he'd be a good fit there. But like I said, they still haven't done anything. Still got this chunk of money. Guess we'll see what happens at training camp. Because of the talent they have at the skill positions, you know, at wide receiver, if Michael Thomas is truly healthy and, and you know, ready to play, Chris Olave, we touched on him. They're a team with a decent floor. I just think this year is going to be a floor outcome for them. They have a nine and a half win total, which is inflated. I'm under that. I think they're a, a seven and 10 team. They would suck if they went seven and ten again. But uh, same, I'll take the under uh, seven or eight wins. Uh, probably finish depending on where you know they could finish second or third. I'm with you guys. I think they win eight games, maybe. But it'll be interesting to see if they go through the year with kind of the same record with a upgrade, I guess, at quarterback. What's their move moving forward? Do they look for a new coach? Do they look to draft a quarterback to have that quarterback start in the next year or two and Carr has to go find another place to play? I just feel like it's going to be a, a lot of the same with that team this year. A lot of, especially if Michael Thomas can't get back on the field, I think it's just going to be kind of a, of a run it back from last year with a different guy in at quarterback. Yeah. I mean, with QBs do go go to second teams and get rejuvenated and things do happen, you know, not in Indianapolis though, but you know, other teams, um, we'll see. I'm not a card at over, not a hater like Matt. Um, but I think he's going, could be serviceable enough to manage that offense without turning the ball over too much. I'm not a hater. I just, you hate him. I've been mad at you lower on Aaron him. Aaron. It's just, he was, he's, yeah, I, I don't know. I just don't think he's that great. If he was having a, I was having an MVP, t, MVP type season. God, this would have been four, seven or eight years ago. And then they yeah, like 2015, and, I think. And the Colts, they, he broke his leg against the Colts and he's just not quite been the same since then. Maybe that was just kind of a, of, of an anomaly type year where he was just lighting the world on fire, but it just seems like he was never able to get back to that level after the Colts rolled him up and, and broke his leg. It kind of tanked the then Oakland Raiders chance chances in the playoffs. Yeah. They were 12 and three. And they're, Schedule their first four or six games are on their on the road, and the last two of three are out road. And then they're uh, at home a lot for the middle. Yeah, home a lot for the middle, and they're things. teams that same place in their respective division. At Pats, home against the York Giants, at Chargers. Here's a fun fact: they could easily go oh, with it, but they could easily go oh, and three. Here's a fun fact. The Saints play Houston twice this year. Oh, wow. So another team did it. Once nice. in the preseason and once in the regular season. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you guys come. They could play the real. Games. Right. They real good. Good. That's true. <laughs> the real good info coming with the real good stats here, folks. If they three play seasons. three times, if they play three times, someone's going to make a lot of money. Um, okay, last place finishers, uh, the Atlanta Falcons, seven and ten, again last year. Uh, if I had a dark horse to win the division, this team. Um, we'll see a lot of talent. Uh, they have what week eleven by. They got to play the Commanders, Cardinals, and Jets. Their uh, same place in other divisions. First six games, five are on the uh, at home. Week four is uh, technically at home game, but it does take place in London at Wembley. Uh, last three or four are up. Shoals. Wembley. Uh, they like I said, they also went seven and ten. They won seven and ten the year before, and they haven't won over seven games since two thousand seventeen. So Kyle, they 
They brought in a bunch of defensive guys, pass rushers, drafted Bijan, already had a couple decent running backs in Tyler Algier and uh, Cordero Patterson and uh, Pitts. If they can utilize him the way they should have last year, be a dangerous team. They've got Drake London, too. And Kyle, you're high on the Panthers. I'm high on the Falcons. I think the Falcons are the team that are going to win this. Nice. Okay. Um, I think Arthur Smith is a hell of a coach. Um, he seems to... He did really well as an assistant in Tennessee. He's starting to make the changes, kind of turn the ship around in, in Atlanta. To your point, they brought in a ton of free agents on the defense to improve that defense. The defense wasn't good last year. Um it's going to be much improved this year with guys like Jesse Bates, Calais Campbell, Bud Dupree, Trey Flowers. Um, the the really, I mean, their their offensive talent is there. The really the only question is a quarterback, which is the biggest question. I mean, is Desmond Ritter your guy? Um, is he going to be able to show that he can lead an, an NFL level top ten type offense, or is Taylor Heineke going to be starting come week five or six? And if that's the case then I don't think they have a great chance of winning the division. But I think because of the coaching, because of the pieces they brought in on defense, because of that offensive talent, I think they win the, this division. It's a weak division, so I th- but I think they win it. Yeah, I think regardless of, of if it's Taylor Heineke or, or Desmond Ritter in there, they're going to lean on their running game, and that's going to help keep them in games. And they're going to play defense. You know, they shit ton of changes to the defense like like Kyle alluded to earlier they already had AJ Terrell who's one hell of a corner they brought in Jesse they had a they kind of had a down year last year but uh I think they'll be back Terrell oh yeah I mean the talent is still there um they were very very aggressive with that Pitts like I don't think it's that it's they used him incorrectly it's oh they just they used him more blocking, which he is also good at. Yeah. You know, they made that. That's what was required of him in the way they run their offense. Yeah. But if you're know, looking at some uh, clips and, and things, they made him a decoy a lot when he's so talented and dynamic. Why? Why? Yeah. yeah. Why do you? Why do you draft a guy that high if you're going to not make him a focal yeah. point of the offense? Yeah. I mean, of course it would be somebody named Kyle, too. Right. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yep. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Pitts only had 300 yards, 400 yards, something like that. He didn't have much. It's not, not, not good. Any book. I think that will change this year. It has to. Because, yes. I mean, even uh, again, watching some clips, you can see where he didn't, felt kind of like he was sluggish and not really running the route like he could because he was probably a little. You know, disappointed with the way that they were using him. So the guy's six six, Drake London six four. Fucking utilize that that height. Once Ritter come in though, he peppered the shit out of Drake London on yeah. targets. He averaged like ten a game. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. Ritter's accuracy is is still very inconsistent. Uh, struggles to make some throws at times. I'd like to see him lose his meat, his feet more too. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Now they they brought in Bisha, drafted Bisha, complete running back. They are man to go with those other running backs. I I think it's going to be, and they still have Huntley as well. Four running backs, so going to be good. They fifty eight percent of their runs last year were outside zone number one of them you think they'll still do that this year or um because they were 31st in power last year and 32nd counter do you think that i wonder if that'll change a little bit and skew a little bit more with bichon i think i'm doing more power dude i think it has to i think just i mean even if they hadn't drafted bichon you want to be more balanced with your runs and i mean that, that was a really good stack Kyle. Um, they were literally like 29th in inside zone, 31st in power, 32nd counter, and 31st in draw, but first in outside zone. They run a constant. So we'll see if that, you know, I think Bijan can do that stuff. I 
you watched him do some of those runs for Texas. He can do that. But this is a team that was built to win, you know, a favorable decision. You know, it's up for the grabs. It's up for the grabs. It's up for the grabs. Um, and yeah, their defense was atrocious last year. 27th in total yards per game allowed. 25th in pass allowed per game. And 23rd allowed per game. So what they did for, for defense is, is going to play as Campbell there uh, as well. So bring a better presence on that line. Um, Edward Jarrett, they still have a lot of good pieces. They basically I, took they took Cincy's secondary with Flowers and, and Jesse Bates. And, and Bates is a top three safety in the league. So, like I said, they're going to be better on defense. And if they're just marginally better on defense, I think they'll be more than that. Their record should improve, especially with that week's schedule. They have last play scheduled. Not only do they play the, the AFC South, um, they play each other within the division, but they get two other last place teams from the NFC West and the NFC East. So, um, I, I just, I think this is the year that the Falcons take a big leap. Yeah. Like, like I said, I got it for my dark horse to, to do it. You know, I like Carolina just a, a bit better. Um, they're going to be very watchable. You know what I'm saying? They're not somebody you're going to not watch. What's oh, so funny, man? Oh, Um, they also drafted that guard, Matthew Bergeron, high on him too. I think he's going to help that line tremendously. Yeah, they've, they have a, a tricky win total too, at eight and a half. And, um, I think they're another eight to nine win team. I wouldn't be floored if nine wins took the division. Yeah. Between either Atlanta or or Carolina, but that eight point eight and a half number, I'm shading that. I won't. Even, I wouldn't even bet on that. Uh, I'll take the over. I say they can win nine. Um, again, I think they're going to be, you know, a better team. That I think they can win those close NFC South games, and uh, win a bunch of games in the division, and then that. Commanders, Cardinals, Jets for their their respective division place, fourth place finishers. Uh, I think they could win all those. Jets might be a little tough, but we're not really sure what we're going to see with the Jets totally this year with uh, Rodgers at the helm. Yeah, I'll take I'll take the over, but I wouldn't put the house on it. I wouldn't even probably put ten bucks on it. I think it's really close. I think they'll be nine. May if everything goes right, they could be a ten win team. But I think they're right around nine. I think they win the division, though, with nine wins. You, you, you said you're kind of high in a winning division, but I just don't feel that conviction from you, Ramey, about that. I love the Falcons. <laughs> I think they're, and they've got everything. It's just, is Ritter going to be the guy? Um, that's the thing. If he can manage the offense, I think they'll, I think they'll, they'll take the division. I mean, and he, this four games he had last year, Two of them were against New Orleans, great defense. One was against Baltimore, great defense. Uh, and then the other two were Arizona and Tampa Bay, and Arizona was lost by that time. And Tampa Bay was all beat up and playing with, you know, second string. So we'll see what he does. See, I'd like to see him. I'd like to see him play the whole season, you know, and still be effective. Make, he's going to make mistakes. And it's going to happen. More importantly, well, it's coach not make mistakes because Arthur Smith has had some issues the last couple of years with some late game clock management, and uh, he needs to clean that up. Hire somebody to fucking stand on your fucking shoulder and help you. I submit my resume for that. Russian. <laughs> <laughs> hey, take your time out. It's very possible this team could lead the league in rushing this year. I'd be they more surprised if they didn't. Yeah. They were third last year and they drafted a running back eighth. So you're you're absolutely right. I th I think they'll lead the league. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see and, if you know, Philadelphia does it a little bit better still. Yeah. Something like the Lions or San Francisco, perhaps. 
I mean, that seems to be the way they're they're gonna they built their team is to run the ball and play now play good defense. So that clock management could very well come into play um, next year. So we'll see. Yep. Cool. Well, that wraps up our division preview of the NFC South. Kyle, do you think you can introduce the pick sixer without completely fucking yourself? <laughs> Very possible. Welcome back, everybody, where it's time for our pick sixer segment. Uh, today's topic, or sorry, this week's topic is favorite baseball players. So top six, I'll go ahead and get her started. Uh, in no particular order for me, Miguel Cabrera. Uh, you'll see a few Tigers on this list. Uh, being there uh, from Michigan, um, won a few batting titles, two MVPs, uh, got that triple crown in 2012. Uh, sadly, he will be retiring in that at the end of the season, but we will get that albatross of a contract off the books, which will be nice. Number two, Ken Griffey Jr., the kid. Um, you know, just what a sweet, beautiful swing. Great defensive player too. Won numerous gold gloves. Um, did uh, get in or did make it into the Baseball Hall of Fame with one of the highest voting percentages in history. Uh, next, Cecil Fielder, uh, power hitter in the '90s, uh, joined the Tigers in in 1990. Uh, he had 51 home runs that year, league leading 132 RBIs. Uh, just just outstanding one. Was an all-star three times, silver slugger a couple times. I, I I loved him as a kid. Did you know his son played baseball? I sure did, Prince. Yeah. Played for the Rangers, Tigers, Milwaukee, I believe. So had to retire because what did he have? Hip injury that was bad. He couldn't can't remember what Prince's thing was. He had a bad hip injury or something. I don't know. Ken Griffey Jr.'s uh, dad played baseball too. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Uh Next, Justin Verlander, another Tiger. Um, just one of he's my favorite pitcher. Love him. Uh, I'm sad when I traded him to the to that cheating Astros, but you know I was happy for him. We won a title. That later I found out that they cheated. You know, kind of put a bad taste in my mouth. Uh, next one, Gary Sheffield, another player in the '90s, just as consistent as they came. Uh, Kind of a bit of a surprise how good he was. He played for so many teams. Loved his batting stance, that bat waggle. Uh, loved it. And next, uh, or sorry, lastly, uh, Maglio Ordonez. Uh, just, of course, Tigers fans will remember him for uh, the walk-off home run in game four uh, in the ALCS against Oakland 2007. Just, I remember just screaming at the top of my lungs living room staring at TV and watching it on the game. Loved it. That was a uh, stabbing uh, cabin. Yep. Stabbing cabin. It was. Um, that does it for my pick sixer. Uh, Ramey, I'll shift over to you, sir. Prince Fielder retired because of two spinal fusions. Sir. Oh, spinal. So hip, I was definitely wrong. Yes. Yes. My top six players in no particular order. Number one, number six, however you want to say it. Anthony Rizzo. <laughs> R I Z Z O uh, was my favorite player of the mid T two thousand teens Cubs teams, specifically the one that won the World Series in twenty sixteen. Um career two sixty three average. He's he's Pushing 300 home runs and 1,000 RBI, so he's not done great this year with the Yankees, but when he was with the Cubs, he was always a big contributor and was pretty consistent about 30 home runs and 100, 110 RBI, so really enjoyed watching him. Uh, he was five. Sorry, I didn't mean to, to interrupt. No, no. Um, he, I was just going to say, like, of that team, to me, he seemed to be the most likable. Yeah, he was the leader. Um, he was there. He was the first piece, really. Him and him and Castro um, were the pieces when they started to turn things around. He was in the Boston farm system when Theo was the GM there and then traded to San Diego um, uh, 
once Theo came to Chicago, he targeted him as a guy he wanted to make a cornerstone of that team as it as they built it back up. And he was, and he was he was the clubhouse presence. He was the the leader in the clubhouse. He was the guy who would get in somebody's face, whether it be on the Cubs or on another team, if something needed to be done. So he was he was a very likable player, um, and one of my favorite players of all time. Uh, number five, Kerry Wood. You're going to see a theme with my players. Uh, 1998 Rookie of the Year, uh, famously known as the Kerry Wood game, one of the, if not the, um, statistically best pitching performances of all time in his fifth start, fifth career start, um, 20 strikeouts, one hit, one hit by pitch, no walks, and a 2-0 Cubs win over the Astros. In 1998, I can remember watching the tail end of that game coming home from school and uh, the, just being amazed. He, he hadn't really done much in the way of, uh, of, uh, of performing well out of the gate until that game. And he even said after the game that he didn't really feel like he warmed up that well. So to have that kind of pitching performance was pretty amazing. Um, overall, his, his stats were okay. He was only 86 and 75. He had a, just shy of a a 3.7 ERA um, spent time as a, as a starter until injuries forced him to the bullpen. He ended up being the Cubs closer for a while and they kind of bounced between the Indians and the Yankees uh, as a reliever, but uh, just one of my favorite Cubs of all time. Uh, number four, Greg Maddox, just a, uh, one of the best pitchers of all time, 355 wins, a career 3.16 ERA. Um, 18 gold gloves for Cy Youngs. He had that one World Series with Atlanta. Uh, should have had more. You can say postseason wise, he wasn't the best pitcher. Uh, kind of underachieved in the postseason. But from a career standpoint, one of the best and spent a majority of that time with the Cubs before going to Atlanta, but returned to the Cubs after after finishing up with Atlanta and uh, really really was fun watching him even later into his career still just be use his intelligence to really continue to dominate um when his stuff wasn't what it once was and um, it was just he so good at location he could put a fucking ball where he fucking wanted it to go unbelievable and not even fast not, not fast not you know just very very good pitcher even when he came back to the cubs and he was kind of, i mean he was not at the end of his career but he didn't have what he what he had in the mid nineties, he would call games for other pitchers, like with, with the catcher, he would call just because he, he knew so much about location pitches, things like that, that the Cubs would let him call a game for a starting pitcher just because they knew he was so knowledgeable and just knew what he was doing. So, um, just a real great baseball mind. Uh, my number three is actually King Griffey jr. Uh, nice. I think it just the, the era of, of us growing up, uh, one of the greatest video game baseball games of all time. King Griffey Jr. Baseball. Um, one of the guys, uh, if it hadn't been for injuries, he, he may have damn near hit 800 home runs. And to everyone's belief, he did it clean. I think that's one of the reasons also why he's on, on the on many people's top lists of baseball players. But I mean, 286 career average, 630 home runs, 10, 10 gold gloves, seven silver sluggers, Hall of Fame career. And again, that video game took me, took me through the 90s. So... Uh, my number two and number one are both Cubs. Uh, my number two is Mark Grace, uh, career 303 hitter. Just a, a really interesting character. Um, was a re really solid baseball player, really solid first baseman, both with the Cubs. And then later he, he went on to the Diamondbacks and won a World Series with them in uh, in 2003, I believe. 2002, he might have been. Um, but uh, just was a guy that really embraced Cubs culture, even though the teams weren't that good. Uh, really enjoyed Wrigleyville as well. Uh, you know what I mean? So might have gotten him into, into a little bit of hot water from time to time. But uh, just was one of those players that I watched growing up uh, on WGN, along with my number one, uh, Ryan Sandberg, second baseman for the Cubs. Uh, Hall of Famer, 285 average, 282 home runs, over, just over 1,000 RBIs, uh, seven Seven-time Silver Slugger, nine-time Gold Glover. Really kind of was one of the first guys at, at the second base position to really show a lot of power uh, in the in the mid-80s and then into the, his, the end of his career into the early and mid-90s. 
Uh, but again, just one of those really likable players on on some Cubs teams that were successful before I can remember. I mean, the 84 team almost went to the World Series, made it to the NLCS. But was one of those as I started to really get into baseball growing up. He was a player that I, I really enjoyed. I actually have his jersey. So um, those are my top six baseball players of all time. Matt, nice. what do you got for us? You laid all the stats down for all of this, right? I did. I did. Like, wow. You just... Like, I kind of started with that, and I was like, holy oh, shit, I got a lot of shit to talk about here. And I'm like, cut, 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 cut. I'm like, this yeah. is too much. Oh, there, oh no, that's a good. There's way that's more if you'd like that, me to continue. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. You could. You could. You could. Yeah. Um, are yeah. they the only team with a positive run differential in their division? I can't remember. They are. And they're okay. third place. Just check. Seven. Yeah. Got Thank it. you. Matt, step up to the plate, buddy. Uh, Cub fans are like vegans. They love to tell you about it. <laughs> number six for me uh somebody you just mentioned Ramey, greg maddox he had absolutely masterful uh control and command and for people that don't know the difference control is being able to throw a strike whenever you want command is being able to throw it knee high on the outer quarter of the plate um he dominated without overpowering anybody number five uh for me is alan trammell he was my favorite player growing up, it, you know, routinely all-star level player. Uh, you know, don't get me started on Cal Ripken and Back you know, all that whole shape. <laughs> Still on the team. Um, yeah. And, and for a while, I always felt like he didn't get the recognition he deserved for just how good of a player he was. Um, you know, Trammell and, and his buddy there at second base, Lou Whitaker, they were the, the longest running uh, double play duo in MLB history. Put Lou Whitaker in the hall. Still giving. Uh, number four, Ken Griffey Jr. Beautiful swing, did it clean in the steroid era. He was amazing. Um, my number three, somebody who was also amazing in that era, Pedro Martinez. At the height of the steroid era in 1999 and 2000, combined between those two seasons, he went 41 and 10. Pitched 430 innings, struck out 597 guys through 12 complete games, five shutouts, and had a 1.9 ERA. Yeah, that's shockingly good. Just unfucking real. Yeah. Um, number two for me, David Justice, prominent part of those 1990s Braves teams, and he landed Halle Berry. Like, how can you not like that? Um, number one for me, Mr. Tiger, Al Kaline. He's the youngest player to win a batting title. Uh, put up like an 8.5 war season at 20 years old. Member of the 3000 Hit Club, the Hall of Fame, and, you know, also has batteries named after him. Yeah, Alkaline. Yeah. Those are my six in a particular order. Nice, nice. So we all had Kevin Griffey Jr. on our list, and, and all of us growing up around the the same time frame and uh, stuff. I know I have the elder statesman here. Uh, wow, statesman stretch. <laughs> the, the old motherfucker. Um, yeah, we all had Griffey. And yeah, that to 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 nail it home, he did it clean. And just, he had that charisma. And just, he was great with the fans. And you never heard him getting in trouble for anything else really off the field. Um, Stand-up guy. Maybe he pioneered gift baskets. He is he is a global ambassador of the base of the game of baseball. You know he's popular worldwide. So, heck yeah, love to watch it. Uh, that wraps up our. Oh, I was going to say like, when it comes to that era of baseball, the steroid era, I'm not a fan of of holding players out of the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I agree. You don't just put them in. You can't tell the story of. Baseball without Mark McGuire. You can't tell the story of baseball without Sammy Sosa. Like steroids or not, their home run chase is what brought a lot of fans back after the strike. That's true. That wraps up our pick sixer for this week. It's time for our back in the day replay, our look back at historical events, both sports and non-sports related. Kyle, um, why don't you lead us off? 
All righty. Uh, this week in history, July 25th, 1956, Pittsburgh Pirates Roberto Clemente hits the Major League Baseball's first and only walk off inside the park grand slam for a 9 8 win over the visiting Chicago Cubs. Uh, the Pittsburgh Post Galette said he hit one high and inside, and he was lucky to actually score because he slid, missed the plate, and was able to reach back. Uh, with his hand and get get it out of there. So, um, Roberto Clemente, great player. Uh, always known as one of the best bad pitch hitters ever. Like he would swing at anything everywhere. Uh, Matt, you're back in the day for this week. Yes, July 24th, 1983. The Kansas City Royals are, are playing at the New York Yankees. Two outs, bottom of the ninth. Kansas City Royals third baseman George Brett hits what appears to be a two-run homer off of Goose Gossage. The Yankees manager Billy Martin protested, saying George Brett's bat had too much pine tar on it. It was measured at the plate, which, if in case you don't know, you're allowed pine tar up to the 17-inch mark, which is the width of home plate. Umpires called him out. Kansas City protested. The game was restarted later in the year. Billy Martin, in a form of protest, put Ron Guidry out in center field and put Don Mattingly at second base. The Royals ended up winning the game. Yeah. The the image of George Brett climbing, running the steps out of the That field. is the fastest with his, guarantee with his he has eyes, ever run. Right. With his eyes, just he was fucking livid. Just pure rage. Yep. That, that memory sticks with me, that clip. He was pissed. And he had jaw on his shit was coming out of his mouth while he was uh, uh, screaming and bitching. So, hell of a player, though. Hell of a hitter. Yeah, he was. Ramey? I'm going to go away from baseball since uh, the British Open concluded on Sunday. In the year 2000, Tiger Woods became the youngest player to complete a career grand slam when he won the British Open. He was 24 years old. He went on to win 15 major championships and arguably could have won more had he not just stayed away from Perkins. Got just Dickens pants. Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting. I think it's interesting with him what drove him to be so successful also played in a part of an argument to be made that he could have underachieved in his career because he had that after 2009, after the divorce and everything came out and again, he broke his leg and and won a U.S. open, but then didn't win any major championships until the, the masters in 2018. Um, it's a, it's the, If not the most, it's the second most successful golf career of all time. But you could make an argument that he should have or could have done more. But that's just sort of it's just very interesting guy. I believe, like you've seen his uh, son out there playing, and he looks good too. And he's you know just a teenager or whatever, young teenager, I believe. And there's you know already talks about him looking good, and what we'll see. I'm in a PGA Tour game uh, in a decade or less. I mean, if your dad was 24. Jesus. I can't believe he was so good. He let the world on fire with golf. I am not a golf guy. I was following Tiger Woods and what that man should do. He changed golf. I mean, he made it a mainstream sport. And to this day, I think it's still more popular now than it ever was prior to Tiger. I mean, you had the casual golf fans that, that would watch, but... He just completely changed the game with how dominant he was. That wraps up our back in the day replay. Be sure to comment and let us know what you think. If you have any cool tidbits or uh, moments in history that you'd like to share, please do that. We'd appreciate it. Episode web. You think we'd make it this far already? Or just think we'd give up after like six? Oh yeah. I thought that'd be better. <laughs> All right. We tried. We ain't famous now. Fuck it. I got other shows there. <laughs> yeah. Power and glory, signing off. (laughs) Oh, a big thank you to all of our subscribers and and everybody who has helped make this channel 
29 subscribers successful. We are available on all the social medias. We have a website on the internet, www.stonedonsportspodcast.com. You can type those letters into your internet browser of choice and find we have a website that will send you back here to YouTube. Or all the other streaming platforms from Apple to Spotify, Google, uh, Am- Amazon, all of them. So they're now the link. All the links are there. Of course, Napster. Either. Napster. Yes. Yes. LimeWire, uh, Napster. Check those out. <laughs> and any 20 year olds would be like, yeah. Wasn't that not the greatest thing back in the day? Boom. Boom. Yeah. 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 You got a song. Go on, go on LimeWire and you can download this podcast in a mere eight hours and pretty sensitive. <laughs> You'll spend all that time to download a virus. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That was uh, computer destroyers for sure. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We appreciate all yous. Talk to you next time.